Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll start the webinar, 12th webinar of ASBM University. Uh, respected founder and president of ASBM University, Professor Dr. Bishwajit Patnaik, Revered Vice Chancellor of ASBM University, Professor Dr. Kalyan Shankar Rai, respected Pro Vice Chancellor of ASBM University, Dr. Falgun Iranjana, and respected Dean School of Accountancy. Uh, Dr. Hemant Kumar Panda, esteemed panelists and my dear participants. Welcome you all to the 12th webinar of ASBM University on the topic Trade and Investment, the post-COVID scenario. Asian School of Business Management has been established in the year 2006 by the former professor of IIM Lucknow and Indore, Dr. Vishwajit Patnaik, who is popularly known as Lagan Professor. In the year 2019, 27th September, it became Hello. the state university. The university Professor, regularly. You are not audible. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Professor Sudan Shuji, you are not audible. I can't hear you. Okay. Uh, Good afternoon. And, uh, Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Professor Mandal, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes, both of you are audible completely. Okay. There is no Ma'am, I think uh, there might be some network issues on your end. Can you please check? We could hear. Hello. Yeah. We could hear both of you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. I can hear you now. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Please. Okay. Yes, ASPM University regularly conducts faculty development programs certificate programs, seminar conferences, and webinars. Already we have conducted three certificate programs in last three months in the areas of research methodology, logistic and supply chain management, and human resource management. Two more certificate programs will be conducted very soon in the areas of finance and accounting, sorry, marketing. Let me introduce our two esteemed panelists for today's discussion. Our first panelist, is Mr. Bisal Sukla. He is the Deputy General Manager, Securities and Exchange Board of India, and he is currently is the faculty member of National Institute of Securities Market, NISM, Mumbai, which is established by SEBI. Dr. Mr. Vishal Sukla, he is an MBA from University Business School, Punjab University, Chandigarh, and Masters in Public Policy from Graduate Research Institute for Policy Studies, Tokyo. Mr. Bisal Sukla has been working with Securities and Exchange Board of India, that is SEBI, since 2002 and is currently posted with NISM as a faculty member in the School for Regulatory Studies and Supervision. While at SEBI, Mr. Sukla has gained invaluable experience in licensing of market intermediaries and conducting inspections, market surveillance, and handling investor grievances. Mr. Bisal Sukla is currently teaching securities market law and he is a bit interested in macroeconomics, financial economics, and aspects related to regulation of financial markets. Today, Mr. Sukla will deliver his talk on the topic regulatory changes and SEBI actions in the post-COVID era. Coming to the our second panelist of today's webinar, Dr. Latha S. Chari. He is the Associate Professor, National Institute of Securities Market, NISM, Mumbai. Dr. Latha Chari is a doctorate in finance from Bits Pilani, postgraduate in commerce and a fellow member of Institute of Cost Accountant of India. She has an experience of about two decades in academia and industry. She started her academic career as a fellow with IILM New Delhi. Before joining NISM, Dr. Chari has worked with Institute for Technology and Management and ITM Institute of Financial Markets for more than a decade. She joined ITM as a lecturer and grew of the hierarchy to become the deputy director heading ITM Institute of Financial Markets. During her academic tenure, she has published many papers in reputed national and international journals and conducted MDPs in the areas of financial assets valuation, strategic cost management, trading and operations in equity market, performance evaluation of mutual funds and the like. Dr. Chari, areas of research interest includes strategic cost management, corporate valuations, shareholders value enhancement and similar studies. She has special interest in establishing finance labs 
and in design development and delivery of lab based course in the areas of banking and financial markets coming to the today's topic that is trade and investment the post covid scenario as we all know covid 19 is a dark cloud that has suddenly descended on humanity but even the darkest cloud has silver linings indeed the chinese word for crisis that is wizi which signifies danger as well as opportunity the black death of europe in the 13th century and pre 19th century cholera epidemics and spanish flu in pandemic 1918 not only shook societies and economies but also opened new pathways to change there is little doubt that the covid 19 crisis will similarly change the world in profound ways perhaps permanently but it will also come with opportunity and all the countries need to be alert to such opportunities so that some good potentially be extracted from so much bad one of the changes will be reevaluation of the long and complex value chain that have over three decades last three decades supported dramatic improvements in manufacturing efficiency and material standard across the world these value chain financed enthusiastically by investors in advanced economies have also allowed china to become the factory of the world efficiency and profits of the investment location decisions not trail risk or black swan events competitiveness prevailed over resilience to achieve the right balance between the two investors will soaring uh, scoring the world for locations where strong states have shown themselves capable of managing black swan event effectively the covid 19 pandemic has made that tellingly transparent for foreign investors looking alternative investment locations that leaves few very few countries that have strong government capable of replacing china as an important source of cheap skilled labor in india and indonesia should top the list of the candidates they are large countries located near china moreover india has been unusually effective in dealing with covid 19 crisis so far it's important that india is considered to say our values and interests that align closely with those of western democracies democracies it has impressive entrepreneurial talent a large internal market and thriving private enterprises its analytic financial and management services are world class clearly india needs a fundamental shift in its attitude towards trade and foreign investments if it is to figure in the emerging post covid 19 calculus of foreign investors in the event it doesn't it will once again forego an opportunity to benefit from the expected post covid tsunami of firms that will choose to relocate away from china so uh, without wasting time i just want to continue for the discussion i would like to request our first panelist today mr bisal sukla to address the participants sir please thank you professor anda uh, hope i am uh, yes, audible sir. Uh, yeah thank you thanks a lot professor nanda uh, good evening everyone uh, i am uh, thankful to ab sorry afbm university and uh, vice chancellor uh, dr kalyan uh, shankar rai uh, uh, dr bishwajit uh, patnaik the founder uh, president pro vice chancellor uh, dr philangani ranjana and uh, dean dr hemanta panda and distinguished faculty members and students so today uh, i'll be beginning with uh, laying down the regulatory framework which evolved as a result of uh, the covid 19 crisis and after uh, you know i'm over with my presentation of about 15 to 20 minutes then madam is going to speak about uh, how the markets uh, performed so we are uh, going to restrict ourselves to securities market since we belong to you know securities market institute and uh, the aspects that we'll be discussing today would be relating uh, mostly to the securities market so i have prepared a small presentation and i'll be sharing that presentation uh, you know uh, with you i'll just uh, start presenting myself please let me know if uh, my screen is uh, visible to you i hope uh, now my my screen is visible uh, i am hello uh, 
Doctor, Doctor Nanda, is is my screen visible now? Not yet, sir. Not yet, Vishal ji. And just, just see. Somehow it's taking time. Yeah, sometimes it takes a few minutes to come on. Yeah. I think now, now it will be visible. Yeah, presentation, yes. Yeah, it's Starting to be visible, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, we'll be speaking about uh, the regulatory and supervisory response, uh, supervisory response to deal uh, with the impact of COVID-19 uh, scenario. And basically, uh, I'll be restricting myself uh, to the securities market. And, uh, you know, if we look at this uh, scenario, it's a very, very serious crisis. Uh, and as uh, uh, Professor Nanda mentioned that it is a serious dark cloud over humanity. And uh, it has had uh, its impact on nearly all the aspects of life and uh, the commercial aspects uh, notwithstanding, they've also been, uh, you know, hit hard. And one important aspect is that uh, the markets, uh, you know, as compared to the real economy, they bottom out very fast. Uh, and they respond to such crises uh, in, in, in a very, very swift uh, uh, manner. Hello. Sorry to interrupt, sir, but screen is not visible, sir. It's not. Uh, Professor Nanda, my screen is visible or not? Is a screen visible, but sir, just pin the screen. Yeah, sorry, sir, your uh, screen is visible, but I yeah. think uh, it is visible along with the other photographs. So maybe you uh, means people's uh, uh, photographs. Maybe you have to search it out and then choose that and then change your uh, uh, what shall I say uh, display to be able to. See I'm this. I'm using the full uh, yeah like the full screen display. Uh, no, that's uh, for the participants. Yeah. For me, it's visible and very yeah, nice. Visible, sir. Visible. Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, we can easily draw parallels between uh, the crisis caused by the global financial crisis in 2008 and uh, the crisis that has been caused by this COVID-19 global pandemic. If you look at the markets, as I said, that the markets, you know, are uh, responding very swiftly to such crises. So if you look at uh, this comparison between the global financial crisis in 2008 and uh, the crisis that has unfolded in the markets after COVID-19, uh, so uh, the markets were, say, at 6287. Nifty was at 6287 on January 8, 2008, and it fell down uh, to 4073 on September 14, 2008, which was the lemon shock, and it further fell to 2524 on October 27, 2008. So there was a steep drop in the market in a period of uh, seven to eight months. Whereas if you see the COVID-19 scenario, uh, the market was at all time high. Nifty was at an all time high of 12,362 on January 14, 2020. These are the closing values of uh, Nifty. And it fell to 7610 on March 23, 2020. So the, uh, the fall here was much steeper. It was much more rapid uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, it has still not reached the levels of January uh, 2020, but we have come up, like we've come up to 11,300. Uh, uh, I think yesterday it was 11,312. So we are trying, you know, to uh, now reach those levels which we had touched in uh, uh, the January of uh, 2020. There's another uh, measure, you know, which we can use to compare uh, the volatility in the markets uh, during these two time phases. So the volatility index uh, of the Indian markets, uh, if you compare for 2008 and for this uh, global uh, pandemic, they are nearly the same. Uh, normally, we have the volatility index. Uh, if you go and see the uh, National Stock Exchange uh, website and look at data, normally it is between 18 and 22. Those are the values that you would normally you know, see on most of the days. But uh, during this pandemic, we found values uh, rising about 3 to 3.5 times uh, the normal values, and it rose to about uh, 62. A similar kind of uh, situation was witnessed uh, during, the, during the crisis, uh, global financial crisis, when it was hovering around 55 to 60. The values were like uh, the volatility was very, very high in the markets. Now, uh, 
as a regulator sebi has uh, you know threefold mandate the threefold mandate that sebi has is basically the first and foremost mandate is to protect the investors then it is to regulate the markets and thirdly it is to ensure that the markets uh, are uh, you know uh, that uh, the policies are uh, made for the development of the markets that's the threefold uh, mandate that sebi works with uh, now from all the financial regulators there are some regulatory expectations and these are the regulatory the regulatory expectations which were discussed in a recent paper by imf uh, the source is given at uh, the bottom of my slide so there was this imf paper this was a special series on covid 19 so they had come up with uh, a paper on uh, how the markets uh, rather the securities market regulators should respond and it was more of a wish list and this was before the lockdown had been announced in most of the economies so uh, the wish list was that uh, the response of the regulator should be proactive flexible transparent and approach to react to the rapidly changing scena uh, scenario in addition to that uh, the regulator should respond you know very swiftly to the operational challenges faced by the market participants so the market participants because of uh, the health crisis and also because of uh, the lockdown uh, the there was a resource constraint people were uh, people were not uh, coming to offices there was this uh, problem of uh, reduced strength in offices people were working from home there was a technology issue there was a issue related to cyber security so how would the regulator respond to that another aspect was because there was so much of uh, uh, so much of uh, uh, you know um, like uh, there was uh, this uh, there was not much clarity about how, how the things would evolve so there was a lot of indecision and this resulted in a lot of volatility so the regulatory response was to how to curb the volatility and uh, another aspect was because of the volatility and because of uh, the impact on businesses uh, there was a cer certain risk of uh, some asset classes not performing well and uh, there was some because of uh, non performance and because of uh, illiquidity so there could be some problems on the redemptions so there was a problem in redemptions and uh, there was some likelihood of default so how the regulators would uh, respond to this uh, aspect and uh, another aspect was like uh, whatever the steps the regulator is taking it should be clear in its communication uh, to the stock exchanges uh, uh, to the market participants and to the investors so this was like the expectations uh, from the financial regulators as per this paper by imf now one important aspect you know which uh, the regulators were confronting was on volatility so high volatility is not a very very desirable situation it is not a good situation and market uh, regulators across the world they view volatility you know as as uh, 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 as something which needs to be addressed and uh, they have developed tools to ad address this uh, menace of volatility so uh, some of the tools are trading halts so you have the circuit breakers if the market is uh, say rising or falling below a certain level during the day so the circuit breakers come into play if the index movement is below 10% or above 10% or 20% sorry 15% or 20% uh, accordingly the circuit breakers come into play then there are uh, uh, you know security wise price bands uh, which are uh, which are imposed in addition to that if there is increased volatility then the uh, the uh, regulators also impose increased margins and uh, the other aspect is that uh, during these periods of uh, volatility so there are people who would like to speculate and they would like to short sell so they would like to sell uh, without possessing the stock and then later on buy when the uh, you know stock is uh, trading at a lower price so it was very very important to impose uh, trading restrictions on short selling as well so but there was there is a debate about import, uh, imposing restriction on short selling so there are people who say that uh, if you impose the restrictions on short selling so you are creating illiquidity in the market and uh, there is also this uh, impact on efficient price discovery but any such restriction should be for a short duration and that is what the regulators you know uh, With that view only the regulators imposed this uh, these restrictions on short selling and uh, in indian markets uh, so there was this uh, 10% fall in the market uh, indices and it uh, triggered a market wide uh, circuit break on march 13 2020 and the market had stopped for 45 minutes uh, 
Uh, Madam has done a lot of work in this area. She recently wrote a paper as well on the market-wide circuit breakers. So, Madam uh, could, you know, much more in a, in a much more better way. She could uh, she could uh, you know enumerate this aspect. In addition to this, uh, the Indian stocks uh, had fallen in wake of the COVID-19 outbreak, and CB also imposed restrictions on short selling to stabilize the market. Uh, and maintain investor confidence, and the market margin requirements were uh, were also increased. So SEBI came up with a press release on uh, March 20, 2020, and in this press release, SEBI had discussed about uh, the market-wide position limits. So for each of the securities uh, in in the derivative segments, so there are position limits imposed, so that uh, no one is able to corner the market. So SEBI had uh, come up with the position limits. They had set up the revised position limits. In addition to that, if the position limits were uh, breached, about say it was 95% uh, position limit was reached, then that uh, security was uh, the derivatives in those security was uh, banned, and uh, the trading in that security was only allowed to offset the uh, the already held positions, and. Uh, there were uh, increase uh, increase in the uh, margins imposed on the securities so there was increase in the margin for the non uh, future and options option uh, stocks in the cash market in addition to that uh, cb had also uh, put uh, some revised uh, position limits as i have already spoken and uh, there were some uh, revisions in the price bands of the securities as well Now, on 24th or 25th of March, we all know that India went into a lockdown. So this had imposed a lot of hardships to which we are all, uh, you know, uh, familiar with. So lockdown brought the economies to a standstill. In certain sectors like airlines, uh, manufacturing, travel and tourism, and small businesses and manufacturing, they suffered very, very adversely because of this uh, lockdown. There were certain sectors which uh, were not so severely impacted. So you had pharmaceuticals, you had retail, you had. Uh, uh, finance and uh, you also had the IT sector, which were not so severely impacted by the uh, by this uh, lockdown. But then the impact can only be assessed by the firms themselves. For you know, an outsider to objectively assess this uh, assess this impact is very very difficult. So an objective estimate about these losses that the firms and the businesses have suffered is very difficult to make. In addition to that, as I've spoken before, there was this reduced staff strength and working from home. It also produced challenges in form of uh, productivity and cyber security. So regulators had to, you know, constantly address these issues as well. So there was like representation before the regulators that, uh, you know, they have to they have to come up with some policy statements, some policy initiatives which addresses one the falling markets. Secondly, also the aspects which are operational. So now. When SEBI had come up with the policy initiatives on uh, the request of the market participants, so you know, and also uh, the, uh, the various uh, stock exchanges, so these policy uh, initiatives were basically uh, aimed to achieve mainly two objectives. One was to ensure the business continuity of the market participants and the issuer companies. Uh, by providing them relaxations for disclosures and uh, the various compliances that they have to do with SEBI. And secondly, they had to create an environment for the companies to raise funds. So post the lockdown, the companies would open and they would require funds for their uh, operations to run. Uh, because you know they would be facing this working capital shortage or they would require some additional funds uh, for, for them to function. So this was very, very important for the regulator to create a regulatory environment so that the firms are easily easily able to access uh, the funds but side by side it had also to ensure that while achieving the above two objectives of ensuring market continuity and uh, providing relaxations and also to ensure that uh, the funds are you know easily available it had also to ensure that uh, the governance standards are not lowered that the market integrity is not compromised so say we had to you know it had a it had a like a, a kind of a, a choice between the devil and the deep sea. So you had to look at both the aspects. One was in the interest of the market, and secondly, you had also to protect the governance standards and the uh, integrity of the market. Now, um, CB has prescribed timelines for the market intermediaries to adhere. So CB registers the market intermediaries. It registers the brokers, subbrokers, uh, the, uh, the merchant bankers. Uh, 
and and the host of other uh, intermediaries now these intermediaries when they are registered you know they they are they also have to from time to time file their uh, uh, the periodical reports to sebi so if uh, there is any let up in filing of uh, such information then sebi views it you know very very sternly and some regulatory action or enforcement action is uh, imposed now uh, since already the firms were uh, suffering from the covid 19 uh, related uh, problems so any kind of uh, you know stern action by sebi would have further compounded their uh, problems so sebi took a lenient view and ended the timelines uh, for the regulatory compliances so the mutual funds venture capital uh, capital funds alternate investment funds real investment uh, invest sorry real estate investment trust infrastructure investment trust uh, rtas stock brokers depository participants so whatever uh, information that they were filing before sebi they were given extensions up to june 30 later on these extensions were also extended like uh, there was these relaxations were extended up in some cases up to august uh, 31 and in a few cases up to uh, september 30 so oh. the timelines for uh, reports and disclosures so they have to submit uh, reports like quarterly report then beneficiary owner grievances half yearly internal audit reports of uh, the depository participants half yearly unaudited financial results of mutual funds reports of commissions paid by the mutual funds to the uh, to the distributors reports on status of clients funds and securities then uh, daily margin trading reports by the brokers regulatory filings then compliances for the alternate investment funds venture capital funds reits and invits so these were all extended by a month or two and uh, the relaxations in timelines were also given to the depository participants for conducting their annual system audit and for effecting the transmission of securities and for uh, addressing the requests of uh, the investors uh, to open or to close their demand uh, accounts and uh, to pro process the kyc applications and uploading of kyc form so in all these uh, aspects uh, some extensions were given to the market participants so the other form of uh, extensions which were given was for the listed firms so previously i dealt with the market participants then there are listed firms now these listed firms also have uh, to adhere to certain compliances so they once they list they are governed by uh, sebi listing and other uh, obligations uh, regulations so, so we have uh, lodr regulations we call those regulations as lodr regulations so sebi gave relaxation and timelines to the top 100 uh, listed companies to conduct their agms by september 30 2020 so as per the mca provisions and as per the lodr provisions the companies have to conduct their agms uh, within 5 months of uh, the closure of the financial year so they had to do it uh, by uh, so 5 months would mean say by august 31 so this was extended by one month uh, up to september 2030 2020, 2020 have to conduct the agm they can do virtual agms they can conduct the agms uh, you know virtually and uh, they can ask the investors to there's a provision of e voting they can ask the investors to uh, vote on the on the uh, various uh, proposals uh, through e voting uh, facility which sebi has already put in place in addition to that uh, the board of the companies as we all know functions to the various committees so you have the uh, risk committee you have the nominations committee you have uh, the other committees of the board so they have to meet once a year so extension was given to these committees to have their meeting in addition to that uh, the companies the listed companies also have to submit reports uh, like the certificate of trade share transfer then they have to submit uh, quarterly reports for the investor grievances so whatever grievances the investors may have with the company for say non payment of dividend or for some transfer of shares so you know we have very few companies which still have uh, left with the physical shares mostly we have uh, the you know uh, demat shares but uh, still a few companies are uh, having physical shares so there so there was this uh, extension given and uh, then secretarial compliance reports corporate governance reports all all these uh, were given uh, in these respects uh, there was an extension given uh, to the companies in addition to that uh, the companies also have to disclose their shareholding pattern on a quarterly uh, manner on the stock exchange website so there was this uh, extension given for disclosure of shareholding pattern as well one uh, requirement is to have a maximum gap of 120 days between two board meetings so this uh, was uh, also you know this requirement was also 
Now, one important. So, till now we've been speaking about uh, the relaxation in terms of uh, compliances and the disclosures, uh, the compliances that are to be uh, met by the listed companies. And before that, I discussed about the compliances and the disclosures that were to be, uh, that were to be done by the uh, market intermediaries. Now we come to the second aspect, the second objective. Lay down the policy initiatives uh, post uh, the COVID-19 scenario. So, as per SEBI regulations, uh, there are certain say provisions which the companies have to fulfil. So, we have uh, a set of regulation called as issuance of uh, capital and disclosure regulations (ICDR) 2018. So, as per that regulations, they have certain eligibility norms. So, uh, the companies have to fulfil those eligibility norms before they can raise funds from the market. Now, SEBI had given some relaxations in those eligibility forms so that the firms can have quick access to the funds. Uh, so as per the SEBI regulations, the companies which have bought back securities, uh, as per the SEBI buyback regulations, they cannot raise funds on the market for one year. Uh, the reason is very, very simple. You know, if uh, you have returned the funds to the investors uh, in the past one year and you found no use of fund those funds, so uh, so there should be some cooling of period for one year. It cannot that suddenly some requirement as a reason and the company is raising funds. So, so there's this uh, kind of a cooling of period of one year and after one year, the company can come back and to the market and raise funds. Now, because of this COVID-19 situation and since uh, it was felt that the firms may require funds immediately after the lockdown is lifted. So this uh, aspect of uh, regulation was relaxed and uh, from uh, one year, the period was reduced to six months. Now, the companies which have uh, uh, bought back securities from the investors uh, six months ago, if they feel like they have to raise funds uh, through the fast track issue or through the rights issue, they could uh, easily approach the regulator. They could file their offer document and raise funds. Now, the other aspect is that uh, we have, as I spoke about this regulation, issuance of capital and disclosure. 2018, I'm sorry, I put 2008. This was uh, recently amended. Now it is uh, the new set of regulations has come in. This is 2018. So this is a provision of fast track uh, issues. And uh, this provides firms, uh, the eligible firms, uh, quick access to funds. And uh, the criteria for uh, bringing fast track issues has also been relaxed. Now the companies which are having a market capitalization of public shareholding, uh, uh, about say 100 uh, crores, they can easily uh, access uh, the funds through the fast track issues. Previously, the uh, eligibility criteria was 250 crore. Now it has been reduced to 100 crores. In addition to that, uh, the companies which have listed on stock exchanges for three years and have uh, complied with the LODR, which is the listing and other, other disclosure regulations uh, uh, for last three years, they were uh, eligible under the fast track uh, scheme. Now, SEBI has reduced that time from three years to 18 months. So any company which had uh, listed on the stock exchange for the first time in, uh, you know, during the last 18 months and has been uh, complying with the LODR regulations, they are eligible to bring in on the fast track issues and raise funds. Now, one aspect about raising funds is that, uh, you know, the companies had to a minimum subscription of 90%. If they were uh, unable to achieve this minimum subscription of 90%, uh, they had to uh, refund the investors back. Uh, but uh, now this minimum subscription has been reduced to 75%. So the earlier 90% reduced to 75%. And uh, the uh, SEBI ICDR regulations become operational uh, if the aggregate value of securities is uh, 25 crores. Earlier this value was uh, Sorry, uh, yeah, now it has, uh, sorry, it has been increased to 25 crore. Earlier, this value was 10 crore. So there is a relaxation here as well. So anyone who's raising about 10 crore, uh, the CBI, ICDR regulations uh, will. Uh, so CBI has also, you know, been taking uh, some uh, punitive action against uh, the entities uh, which have indulged in manipulation or SEBI has issued show cause notice to such uh, entities. Um, at times, uh, these entities uh, also avail the consent and settlement mechanism. So under the consent and settlement mechanism, at times the companies uh, 
uh, they approach uh, the there is a high power committee which has been established uh, to look at the consent and settlement mechanism they approach the regulator and uh, they they want to settle the case and in that case the regulator imposes certain kind of uh, uh, monetary I, i should not say penalty but some kind of uh, uh, monetary you know burden is uh, uh, imposed on them and uh, the the entities pay that uh, amount and uh, this amount uh, goes to the consolidated fund of india and uh, the uh, case uh, is uh, uh, considered as settled so no further investigation takes place so such cases uh, the companies were ineligible to come to the fast track uh, issue they they were not uh, eligible to bring the fast track issues but uh, now sebi has uh, allowed uh, the companies which have uh, you know, passed three years which have uh, been issued show cause notice or have uh, settled uh, the cases under the consent mechanism they can also bring the fast track issues sebi has also diluted the provisions uh, for the companies to which the show cause has been issued by sebi uh, and this show cause has been issued under the adjudication proceedings so under the adjudication proceedings we normally levy the monetary penalty and uh, and in addition to that if they have uh, fulfilled the settlement orders so whatever settlement settlement orders uh, were issued in the consent mechanism if they fulfill those orders then they can come and access the markets to the past so uh, at times what happens is that uh, there are some audit qualifications uh, while the auditors you know are looking at the uh, financial books of the companies so the firms have to make the disclosures in their offer letter about these audit qualifications and uh, the firms uh, which have been suspended from trading during preceding 3 years uh, they have been granted a relaxation to bring uh, fast track issues and this period has been reduced from 3 years to 18 months now rbi had allowed a moratorium on loan servicing we are all aware about that uh, there was a deferment on uh, repayment of uh, term loans sebi uh, you know in line with that allowed the registered uh, credit trading agencies to apply differential treatment and to make a distinction whether the non uh, payment or delay of interest or principal is uh, due to lockdown conditions so if uh, the firm or the company was unable to pay the uh say uh, the interest on the fixed income securities on say the uh, on the fixed income securities uh, so they they were uh, they were given this uh, the, uh, this benefit uh, uh, by the credit trading agencies if it was uh, due to the uh, lockdown situation and uh, so th- Uh, these these were not to be classified as uh, defaults then there are valuation agencies which are providing the reference price for the thinly traded securities uh, for the securities held by mutual funds now these valuation agencies were also uh, uh, given a kind of a guideline by sebi that uh, they could also use the same principle of uh, 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 you know making a distinction whether this uh, non payment uh, or delay in principal or interest for the fixed in- is uh, held by the uh, mutual funds uh, if uh, there was uh, you know uh, there was this uh, delay or uh, or some non payment uh, so it it was uh, it could be viewed as uh, not a case of default and uh, it will it will not be classified as a default they could all be supply this differential treatment uh, to such uh, cases so with that uh, i am through with my presentation especially you know there was this uh, mandate on uh, say need to respond to this situation mandate was basically twofold one was to ensure the business continuity and second one was to ensure that uh, the funds have access to the uh, firms have the uh, access to the funds when they require and uh, these were the few steps uh, that sebi has taken these are not the whole steps that i have mentioned over here that uh, i hand it over to professor nand yeah Th- th- thank you so much sir uh, for this beautiful deliberation uh, now i would like to request dr latha chari ma'am to address the participants ma'am please thank you very much uh, professor uh, i'll first share my presentation and then yes. start off
can you see my screen please is my ppt visible no ma'am i'm checking no not visible not visible How about How about now? Yes, I got it. It is coming. Can you see my PowerPoint, please? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. So my colleague, Professor Vishal Shukla, has taken through very, very nicely and beautifully uh, how uh, SEBI as a regulator. has on the one hand uh, protected the markets and the investors in a highly volatile period and then on the other hand how they have facilitated the uh, capital market funds to keep flowing they have not only facilitated and seen that uh, the day to day trading activities go on smoothly on the other hand they have tried to keep the investment uh, raising process the reporting and uh, regulatory process uh, probably freed up the different things that were actually uh, causing a hazard to people who wanted to raise funds and they have kept the markets going so uh, wonderful presentation uh, by my colleague uh, professor vishal shukla so with that uh, at the outset i would also like to thank the management of uh, the university for giving me an opportunity to make this presentation uh, and then i would like to start off with trade and investment post covid scenario uh, i have attempted to make this presentation more factual giving you various data and details and then maybe we will raise some questions based on the data and try to understand about trade and investment in the post covid scenario so that's the way i have uh, designed this presentation okay so let us uh, start off i'm going to share with you first the uh, how the trade and investment uh, predominantly i'm going to stick to equity markets uh, given the time constraint we will just go through uh, the equity capital market equity market segment of the capital markets and understand how uh, the markets have reacted during the covid scenario and then deliberate on uh, uh, what are the reasons how things have moved uh, good bad all the different things yeah so that's what i'm planning so let us start off with the two major indices which is uh, provided by the national stock exchange the nifty index and the uh, bank nifty index okay so you can uh, see this graph where i have uh, provided data from january 2020 to august 2020 okay so the covid shutdown in india happened maybe somewhere here the lockdown announcement happened somewhere here yeah so uh, somewhere in the middle of this fall that you can see uh, maybe uh, not so much in the middle somewhere in the center somewhere here is what the covid lockdown announcement in india happened so as of 31st january uh you can see that the blue line is the nifty index which is this blue line okay and then the red line is the nifty bank index nifty index is the index of top 50 companies listed in the country and the bank index actually covers the uh, psu on the private banks listed and uh, the bank index covers broadly the banking sector we can actually say that the banking sector is 
captured or reflected in the bank index. So let us start with looking at these two major indices which uh, to understand what happened in the capital markets. OK, so the index generally captures uh, the events and the news related to the economy, be it political, be it economic. Everything is reflected in the index in an efficient market. So therefore, let us start with the index and see how the index has behaved. We can see that this nifty index which is the blue line was somewhere around 12,000 in january okay so what happened is with the news of this pandemic coming in it started sloping somewhat uh, slightly up to march and then in march there was a steep fall like vishalji was saying Two times the market wide circuit breaker got triggered in this month of March at the 10% level. 10% plus 10% means directly 20% down in the month of March. So it was probably thinking that maybe nothing will happen to India. We are safe. So we are not seeing a huge slide somewhere in the uh, month of February. It's just trying to hold on. But in the month of March, uh, there is somewhat something like a breakdown. No, no, we are also in trouble, right? So you can see that happening in the month of March here. And it has fallen steeply. And two times the market wide circuit breaker got triggered at the 10% level. And the markets fell to somewhere uh, around uh, the, I will say somewhere around less than 8,000 levels. OK, so this is the fall which happened and post that uh, the market started moving up with the government actually announcing a lot of support uh, measures, both on the monetary policy front and on the fiscal front. So various things, uh, relaxations were announced, starting with the regulatory relaxations. Uh, so with these relaxations getting announced, I think the market started making an up move sometime after the end of March. Uh, and then you can see that they were flat in the month of May. And then now they have actually moved up and they are close to the 12,000 levels, which is uh, around 11,300. I think the, somewhere in the morning, they were somewhere close to 11,500 today. And so we are about uh, 600, 700 points less than the pre-COVID levels as of now with respect to the Nifty 50 index, which is an index of 50 top companies in the country, which means uh, what is the story Nifty 50 is trying to tell us? It is telling us that I got affected by COVID-19. I corrected close to something like 30% to 12,000 to something less than 8,000 levels. And then later on with the stimulus and other uh, positive uh, news flowing into the market with the positive expectation, the Nifty started going up again and we are somewhere near the pre-COVID levels, maybe some 700 points away from the pre-COVID levels. Now let's look at the bank Nifty. Bank Nifty is capturing the banking and the financial services sector. Okay, so we can see that this bank Nifty is this brown line. Huh? The brown line is bank Nifty. It was above Nifty as of January, but then in March, it actually cut across Nifty and fell far more than what Nifty fell. And coming to the recovery part, we can see that still it was more than 30,000. We have plotted Bank Nifty on the secondary axis. Okay, you can see that it was more than 30,000. It fell far below, less than 20,000. And now it is still not yet recovered close to where it was in the pre-COVID levels. Which means, what is the story Bank Nifty is now telling us? It is telling us that, hey there, I fell a lot, but then 
I'm still not as good as the pre-COVID levels. I'm still having some problems. I have probably not recovered completely. And this difference in Nifty not going back to pre-COVID levels is also somewhere attributed to banking stocks, which are part of the top 50 stocks, not really moving up uh, to the extent required. Some of the banking and the NBFC stocks, OK? So this is the story about what Nifty and Bank Nifty is telling us uh, as far as COVID impact is concerned. Now, having said, tracked these major indices, the next question which comes to our mind is, OK, uh, Nifty acted like this, Bank Nifty acted like this, but what happened to the other sectors? OK, were they doing well or are they doing badly? So to do this tracking, I'm going to take you through some of the sectoral indices and we will see how they acted. OK, see, now we start with the pharma index. This is uh, an index of the large pharma companies uh, operating, listed and operating in the country. What we can again see is this is one place where we would all have loved to be if we had known it, right? So you can see that this has not corrected much, okay? And post-COVID, it has just moved far beyond where it was. So it was at 8,000. Now this pharma index is somewhere near 12,000. So this is one sector which was not impacted by COVID at all. It just may be... Uh, corrected slightly here in the month of March, like uh, like what shall I say, uh, to give company to the other sectors, right? So it corrected a little and now it has completely gone upstream after the March and has gone far beyond the pre-COVID levels wherever it was. <coughs> this was also mentioned by Vishalji in his talk. Okay, so next, next, okay, pharma did well, we all know, yes, because that's the sector which has actually taken the limelight in this COVID uh, problem. So let us look at what happened to IT, right? IT, unlike pharma, went through a sharper correction. It fell from 16,000 to somewhere near 12,500. But IT also has actually resumed and gone up. It is somewhere near 18,000 now. So it was 16,000. It has gone well above the pre-COVID levels as of now. Okay. So both pharma and IT have done very well. Probably these were two areas where we should have taken an investment if we wanted to uh, actually make some profits. Okay. Now let's look at the FMCG. Wow, look at that. See, FMCG actually corrected from, what is FMCG? Fast moving consumer goods. The Britannias, the Nestle, the Levers are all here in your FMCG basket. Okay, the ITC, they are all there in this FMCG basket. Okay, so what did this FMCG do? Before COVID, it was somewhere near the 30, between uh, close to 31,000 levels. Okay, look at that. Wow, lockdown. Wow, lockdown again. So the FMCG just fell like anything. Uh, but then at hindsight, if we see a lot of learning comes when we look at data at hindsight, and then try to understand what went right and what went wrong. And that is the purpose behind sharing this data with all of you and making the presentation more factual. OK, see, what can I say at hindsight? See, the FMCGs are the Britannias, the Nestle's, uh, the ITC. ITC is also into uh, making biscuits and uh, your ATA and other things, daily needs. Of course, they have a segment of cigarettes, but they are also into these areas, right? So these are the companies which are there in the FMCG. Do you think that if there is a lockdown, I'm going to stop consuming these goods? Ideally, I would I would buy all this more and store them because there is going to be a lockdown. So do you think this basket should have fallen like this the way it has fallen? Actually, no, isn't it? See, you can see a V here. It's, a, it's, it's just a very sharp recovery. When people realized that 
oh god these companies have fallen and i can't live without my atta and my bread right and my milk right so what has happened to the fmcg it is a complete v it has just gone up skyrocketing and after that it has crossed the 31000 and gone up further so a little bit of what i will say it's not it's not even finance it is not even fundamental analysis it is just common sensical thinking would have helped us to locate that this fall maybe you would have ended up investing somewhere near this uh, 29000 levels itself but still you would have done well isn't it because if your common sense tells you that my rise at our sales is not going to go down what you will do is you will start taking positions in the fmcg counters and even if you had done it somewhere here you would have still not lost a lot of money you would have made money within uh, within a period of less than 6 months now let us look at the media index so what does the media index have it has the z and the other media companies sun tv right all these media companies what we can see is the media companies which we would expect all uh, just like the banking and the financial services sector this is one sector that has been working throughout the lockdown okay but in spite of the sector working throughout the lockdown what we can see is it has fallen quite a lot but then the recovery has not come up to the pre covid levels so here there is a room to see what happened why it has not recovered are the companies really doing well or is there an opportunity to enter into the media sector even now what is ailing the media sector is something which you can uh, still go back and see and try to understand now let's look at the metal index what can we see the metal has fallen substantially and it has recovered also somewhere close to the pre covid levels these are uh, companies like your hindalco right hindustan zinc who are into the metal space okay right so here what we can see is this index also has recovered up to its pre covid levels after falling from more than 2500 2500 etc okay so what what can we say the nifty has reached close to pre covid but has not crossed the pre covid levels it is still having some distance to reach the pre covid the bank nifty is still stuck midway through through its recovery it has not completely recovered but when we look at the pharma and the it sector they have done extremely well the media has not done well the metal has reached the pre covid levels so broadly what we can see is the different sectoral indices except for uh, media and maybe some more what we have not covered here and there have actually reached or crossed the pre covid levels so now this is the data and this is the story the data is telling the next question fine uh, i am actually a person who teaches fundamental analysis and valuation so my mind keeps going back to fundamentals again and again so the question that actually comes up here is hey there what about the fundamentals the gdp was falling isn't it actually it was falling even in the pre covid times and then we were saying that no no gdp will now start going up we have taken fundamental decisions we have taken decisions at the ground level which is going to be uh, helping the industry it is going to reverse the capex cycle and make things happen all these were the things we were speaking and the markets continued to hold on in expectation that there will be an economic turn around but what actually happened post january february actually we we came to understand that Uh, this is not going to really happen we are not going to turn around we are going to fall further so what about the fundamentals and has the gdp started going up is the industrial production going up is the sales already going up are companies really making money how is it that the markets have already gone up are we are is the economy really running and up right so this is one question which will come back to our minds if we are doing any fundamental analysis right so uh, 
so maybe i'm just pausing to let your minds uh, think what about the fundamentals right so what is the news regarding fundamentals i think i don't want to go into the economic uh, related uh, data because we have less time and maybe i'm running out of time okay right so i have actually made a graph of what we call as the price to earnings and the price to book value ratio <laughs> okay just to uh, give a quick and a very fast perspective of what we call as fundamentals we know that the gdp is not really going up we know that we are expecting the gdp in the year 2021 to fall right we know all these things but still why is it that the market is going up is it not aligned with fundamentals is is there something else which is pushing up the markets these are the different questions that come to our mind okay see here i have put up the ratio of price to earnings and price to book value the blue line here is the price to earnings ratio and the brown lines here is the price to book value ratio what is the price to earnings the price to earnings is for every 1 rupee of earnings what is happening to the price and this price to earnings and price to book value ratio is of the nifty 50 the broad index of the nsc which i have put up here okay now what can we see see we can see that this price to book value was a little below the price to earnings okay for every 1 rupee of earnings the price was at this blue line okay and similarly for every 1 rupee of book value if you are a commerce graduate you know that the undistributed profits which a company is making gets added to what net worth or book value isn't it you know that if a company is making profits what happens to that profit it gets added to the book value the undistributed profit gets added to the book value so what do we expect do we expect share prices to go up after a company announces profits or do we expect it to go up before actually share prices start moving in expectation of future profits future earnings all these different things okay now given that they move up like that what what we can expect is we can expect the price to book value that is the profits to be somewhere little below and share price to go up ahead of it if we are expecting the companies to do well in future okay so that's typically the way you expect these two things to behave okay having said that what we can see they were behaving like that in the period of this august september somewhere in october november december you can see that the price to book value has actually gone ahead of this blue line okay price to earnings but then come february it started falling and you can see see look at how nicely the price to book value also has fallen so this this little bit of Uh, excess book value that was there is getting erased here due to earnings and other results coming in okay now what happened see there is a huge divergence in this july june july between these two things which means the profit is not keeping pace with the price the price has gone up okay but the profits which the companies are making is not keeping pace with the price so price to book value has actually fallen here but then the price to earnings has gone up which means what is it that the market and the investors are expecting they are expecting that once this lockdown is opened up companies will start making huge profits they will all open up whatever is the bottled up demand is going to just come out very fast and the companies will start improving their earnings much faster like the v that we saw in the fmcg graph <coughs> so based on that expectation we can see that the markets have actually gone up so the next question okay fine you are saying that they have gone up like that 
let us also try to uh, see fundamental analysis means that you will not take confirmation from a single indicator you will try to go and see from this route you will see from another route you will see a third indicator you will try to combine many things and then try to understand is it correct or is it more or is it less these types of things right so keeping that in mind what i thought is instead of looking within the country okay shall we see what's happening across the globe during the same period okay so what i have done is uh, i have decided to peep into what's happening in china what's happening in us they all also fell did they go up or are they still waiting down below right that will give me an idea about what my peers are thinking right so what can we see here i have put the global picture across we can see from here that china had a double v kind of correction actually this data stops in april we need to uh, update it to uh, june july what i know is china has also come somewhere close to its pre covid levels japan has come to its pre covid levels this line shows the covid the date on which covid got declared within that country as an as a uh, as a problem or as a pandemic etc the first covid case was found and the country started tracking covid on the date on which this uh, this blue line has been put up we can see that singapore markets also fell uh, south korean markets fell the us index just fell very far <laughs> but what we know is it has also corrected all this data on the indices has been collected from the bloomberg terminals okay so again the ftse the uk index also fell sharply and it has started its recovery in the early april and what we know is now these markets have also come somewhere close to their pre covid levels which means okay it is not just we in india are thinking that our own economy will kick start and start going up the rest of the world is also thinking like me isn't it right next now having said that given different analogies with respect to how the market has moved is it right or wrong i also need to uh, talk about what uh, what opportunities this covid has thrown up and also flag off uh, different uh, what shall i say uh, concerns which we have on this market before we actually close this presentation okay so uh, according to me the biggest thing biggest good thing to happen because of covid is change okay uh, as human beings we are all very very uh, what shall i say uh, we just don't like change if you change my laptop also many times i find that the keyboard is not the same as my old laptop and therefore there is some problem if i change my mobile phone again my last mobile was something different and therefore i will take 2 3 days to get used to change small small changes also we as people uh, really don't want to take it in our stride we would like to keep the status quo and keep it going okay what has covid done to us it has actually made us change and change at a very very rapid pace we were all pushed to the corner today if i am addressing so many of you through webinar uh, maybe i would not have done this at all if covid was not there isn't it right so today if we are able to uh, adapt ourselves to technology and start thinking in a new way and if my institution your institution all institutions are trying to exchange knowledge information facts everything the way we are doing using uh, leveraging technology this would not have happened online was there even before why did we not do these sessions right we we just want prefer to meet isn't it right we didn't do them so change at every phase like uh, vishal ji was saying <coughs> like your own uh, professor was saying in his introductory speech has happened but it has happened at a very very rapid pace far beyond what we can foresee be it 
technology or technology adoption adoption be it the middle class or be it uh, any segment across the society within this country be it the student community be it the teachers be it the doctors everybody has adapted to change at a very very rapid and fast pace this is one of the biggest things which covid has done to all of us okay along with making us adapt to change it has also thrown a lot of new opportunities to all of us technology and technology adoption right the digital uh, india right so across sectors you can you can say hospital hospitality whether it is uh, uh, learning and education everywhere technology has become a key driver banking capital markets finance right everywhere it has become a key driver we can see that uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, global economies who are moving away from uh, china for various obvious reasons the questions which arises can we become a manufacturing hub we have started the make in india probably we can become a manufacturing hub making use of this opportunity pharma and health <coughs> healthcare is getting its due share and attention and budget which it has not got in the past new opportunities for startups logistics supply chain research right all these different areas are getting a lot of attention education like i told you online learning proctored exams new creating new learning experiences how do you teach a small kid how do you teach a grown up adult can you uh, can you make the learning experience very different new interesting right all these different things are getting spoken about and different people are trying out new things so a lot of innovation and research is happening and there is a thrust for all these different opportunities so covid has thrown out a lot of new opportunities at all of us so the next thing is in and uh, the most important thing is in spite of covid both banks and capital markets have worked flawlessly supporting the economy and what we know from the data is the capital market has already gone up they have shown the green flag the capital market has shown the green flag the capital market is saying hey there i trust you i know that you guys will do well but is the economy and the fundamentals going to keep up with the expectations of the market if the economy and the fundamentals fail to keep up with the expectations if we fail to capitalize on the opportunities that are thrown up by the covid then uh, the markets can actually reverse and uh, get back so what i can now say is as of now uh, the markets have gone up showing the green flag showing the optimism recognizing the fact that lot of opportunities are being thrown up if we remain idle if we don't pick up these opportunities if we don't pull up our socks and run then i think we are going to lose on these opportunities and the markets will start reflecting that uh, once the uh, confidence gets lost so uh, that's what is my opinion about both trade and investment sticking to capital markets so thank you very much i hope i was able to make some uh, sense out of the time that was provided to me and thank you all of you thank you so much ma'am uh, for this wonderful deliberation and as we are running out of time so quickly we will go for few questions from our participants and uh, uh, one question uh, there from somyashri mahanti for vichal uh, sukla sir that how about the government of india bonds gold sovereign bonds are they safe and best way to invest for long term in this uncertain pandemic scenario please guide it's for vishal sukla sir uh you know being from a regulator i'll not be able to comment upon you know any financial product yes, so if there is any other query i'll i'll be happy to take it i also would like to add whatever views and thoughts i have presented are thoughts of dr lata chari myself these are not the thoughts of either sebi or nism 
the institutions our parent institution and the institution i represent okay so i would like to give a clear disclaimer the data has been collected from bloomberg the thoughts are thoughts and opinion of latachari it does not reflect the opinion of either sebi or nisa yeah so yes. when you talk about investments you need to express and if you don't express what you think it takes you nowhere so i would like to provide this disclaimer to all the participants who are there so it is my Thank own you. thought yeah Sir, sir, ma'am. One more question is there. Uh, can you say that hospital pharma industry had gone through a positive growth, has seen, like, but impacted badly in terms of operations in this COVID situation? Sorry, I couldn't catch your question. Uh, ma'am, uh, so Mr. Mahanti asked, uh, can you say that hospital or pharma industry had gone through a positive growth, has seen uh, high? But impacted badly in terms of operation in this COVID situation. What is your take on this? Based on the data, they have gone through a positive uh, growth cycle, right? Uh, but then, uh, based on how the markets have actually uh, taken it up and reflected, but then we need to uh, confirm it with the quarterly results of the uh, different individual firms, pharma firms. I think some of them have thrown up good results. but then others are uh, see there are various things like your uh, uh, formulations getting the acceptance of fda right uh, new markets getting opened up for the uh, pharma producing companies for their uh, drugs and formulations so in expectations of these things they have gone up and some news also has come in during the covid period in terms of licenses getting approved and formulations getting approved etc so the pharma sector has gone up in expectation of these things turning into sales and profits in future and some companies have actually uh, done well so it will be a mixed basket we need to wait and watch for the uh, uh, financial results thank you ma'am ma'am ma one question is from a student that uh, uh, which sector of the economy are likely to be recover fastest which is the slowest i have already shown you the it sector the pharma sector have all actually already gone up okay so uh, among the sectors what i showed you i think you can see that the media has not reached the pre covid levels and they have their own uh, other problems right so we need to actually uh, that's the uh, short answer to what has already gone up the banking sector has not gone up so much what we can see the banking and the financial services sector has not gone up but the sector is having its own concerns starting from npa to capital adequacy right so they have their own concerns the nbfcs are having their own concerns the non banking finance companies though the uh, regulators have given a moratorium uh, what it means to me is it means uh, i i get more time to pay back nothing has been written off isn't it i am just going to get more time to pay back but even if you give me more time to pay back unless the business picks up where will i pay back from so these are the different types of concerns within the banking and the nbfc sector yeah sure. in short yes uh, and the last question for today's webinar that uh, one question from uh, mr mahesh that can you relate this topic with startup entrepreneurial bharat initiatives and entrepreneurs SME sector, Atma Nibar Bharat startups, MSME entrepreneurship. What do you want? What What is the question, please? Uh, uh, can you relate this topic, trade and investment, with startups, Atma Nibar Bharat initiatives, entrepreneurship, and MSME sectors? What is? Oh, your... definitely. See, all the monetary and fiscal policy initiatives are aimed at giving a lot of relief to the MSME and the SME uh, sectors. You want to add something, Vishal ji? No, ma'am. Please go ahead. I I I agree with you on that. Uh, mostly, we were discussing about the securities market here, but then uh, the as you have rightly pointed out, the fis. the uh, fiscal uh, responses by the government of india and uh, the package that has been given to the smes 
as well as the monetary policy of uh, the reserve bank of india they are more directed towards the other sectors so but yeah, so uh, all, yeah yeah continue sir but yeah uh, but then uh, you know we had restricted ourselves uh, mainly to discuss about uh, the securities market we did not touch upon uh, those aspects uh, during this presentation correct yes yeah. Uh, so uh, no more questions uh, from our participants uh, coming to the end of the session uh, i would like to thank uh, both our panelists stem panelists dr latha chari and mr vishal sukla for this wonderful deliberation on this regulatory framework of sebi the uh, provisions of sebi the uh, situations current situations different fund raising guidelines and conditions imposed by sebi and the uh, uh, nsc sensex and uh, uh, comparison with different countries and thank you so much sir and ma'am for this wonderful deliberation i want thank I, you. i would like to thank thank you, thank you. Uh, our president uh, um, vice chancellor sir and pro vice chancellor ma'am for giving me this opportunity to conduct a webinar on this topic trade and investment the post covid scenario i would also like to thank all the participants for this active participation and uh, uh, cooperation in this webinar through patient learning and uh, definitely uh, uh, i think you have learned a lot of things out of this webinar uh, please be in touch and your certificates e certificates will be provided shortly and uh, i must inform uh, one, uh, in, uh, must inform you that uh, asb university is organizing two certificate programs online certificate program two week certificate programs one is finance and second one is marketing finance will be starting uh, the 28th of august and marketing will be starting 3rd of september so i am just requesting all the participants if you are from those background you can register as soon as possible and please be in touch please visit asbm.ac.in thank you so much have a good day thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you sir thanks thanks thank a lot you. thank you